I'm Anna Turns. I'm an environmental journalist and I write regularly for lots of national publications, things like The Guardian, Positive News, New Scientist, Riverford's Wicked Leaks, um, often about the climate crisis, green jobs, food provenance and biodiversity. My work focuses mainly on solutions, on progress and innovation. And I think right now we're at a real turning point as awareness about the ecological crisis is rising and technology is advancing. We've got real scope to improve the way we produce and consume food. Research shows that cutting our meat consumption is vital in tackling the climate crisis, but with a rapidly growing global population and growing demand for healthy protein, there's huge debate about how we do this, and it's certainly not black and white. So lab-based meat and dairy that is made through precision fermentation and cell cultures could have huge implications from human health to land use, from energy efficiency to greenhouse gas emissions. So when it, if or when it takes off, there's no doubt it will transform the ways we farm our landscape and also disrupt entire food supply chains within the global system. Just recently, a new test restaurant near Tel Aviv in Israel served up the world's first cultured meat dining experience. Behind a glass screen in the restaurant, scientists in lab coats are growing the food in huge vats. Food miles for this fake chicken burger are zero and cultured meat still isn't regulated in Israel so it can't yet charge customers. But this startup is just showing diners a glimpse of the future. And just a couple of weeks ago, Singapore became the first state to approve the sale of cultured meat. But these chicken nuggets were made from cells taken from a live chicken and cultured by a US-based company called Eat Just Inc. It can't yet be approved by the FDA in the US, so they went to Singapore. So often though, the focus in the media is on the gimmicks with a kind of sci-fi twist or the taste and texture of a lab grown piece of meat. Debate might focus on animal welfare, for example, but actually there are also really big concerns about ownership and the distribution of economic benefits. So actually what we're going to explore today is the bigger picture. How will these new alternative proteins impact today's farming community, our food system and also the environment? And how can policy impact how quickly this new industry develops and potentially becomes a mainstream food source that we can buy in supermarkets. So I'm excited to introduce our three speakers today, all experts in their field. Firstly, Dr. Alex Sexton is based at the University of Sheffield and her research examines the policies of food technology and food security. She particularly focuses on alternative approaches to conventional livestock production, including plant-based and cellular agriculture. Secondly, Jamie Arbib is the co-founder of Rethink X, an independent think tank that analyzes and forecasts the speed and scale of tech-driven disruption. Last year, Rethink X published a report which estimates that by 2030, demand for cow products will have fallen by 70%. Rethink X envisages that the start of a new lab-based protein revolution will be the second domestication of plants and animals. So first it was hunter-gatherers starting to farm crops and, and animals. Now it's us starting to produce food using microorganisms on a mass scale. Alice Ritchie is a land use policy advisor. She works as the lead on climate change for the Country Land and Business Association and believes that right now we've got a great chance to build climate change resilience into our rural businesses. Alice advises CLA members across England and Wales and lobbies the government on matters including low carbon farming, carbon accounting and nature based solutions. So we're going to launch a poll now to get an indication of what our audience's views are on these technologies before we begin. And we'll repeat this at the end so we can see how, whether our speakers have maybe changed their minds. So if you'd like to submit your, your answers, see how positive you feel about the emergence of lab grown meat and dairy. Great, thank you. So it's fairly well distributed, actually. <laughs> Interesting, we'll see if that changes towards the end. Um, finally, a few bits of housekeeping before I hand over to our speakers. If you'd like to pose a question during the event, please do so using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. The questions will be monitored and read out later by Jim Elliott of Green Alliance. And you also have the option to upvote questions if, you'd, if you're really keen to, to hear them be asked. The chat function is operational and you're welcome to use this to chat with other attendees, but we won't be monitoring that part for questions. Um, and if you'd like to tweet during the event, the hashtag is GA event. So without further ado, I'd like to ask each one of our speakers for a brief opening about this debate, starting with Alex, over to you. 
Excellent, thanks Anna and uh, everyone who organised this evening and everyone who's watching. Uh, it's really great to be here with you all. Um, so I've been asked to give some opening comments on the perceived risks and concerns about these new food technologies and uh, how we might mitigate them. So in the interest of time, I'm going to concentrate on two concerns that commonly appear in public surveys on these new technologies and uh, were present in the results of the Green Alliance survey that was recently done. Um, so the first one, the first kind of big concern that people can often have is around food safety. So this concern is perhaps not super surprising as there is pretty consistent data in the UK to show that food safety and food standards are top concerns for people. And uh, this becomes even more heightened when it's a, a new technology. So some of the, the kind of key food safety issues that the industry is, is currently working through, um, I've got three just to list here. So the first is around contamination through the growth medium that's used. Um, and also contamination of the end product once it leaves the controlled environment uh, to be processed and packaged. There's also uh, possible allergenicity of the different ingredients that needs to be uh, tested and, and thought through and also uh, regulating for food fraud. Um, if you're interested in this, uh, I published with colleagues in 2018 a paper that um, considered some of these things and there's lots of information uh, being published now on these kinds of questions. So uh, definitely you know, check that out if that's what you're interested in. I think the uh, one of the events that, that Anna mentioned in Singapore recently with Eat Just's uh, Chicken Bikes has been a, a big moment for the sector in kind of proving safety uh, for, for that particular product. And a lot, of, uh, a lot was made of the data showing that the chicken bites um, had zero microbial contamination. So things like E. coli and salmonella that you would find in conventional animal meat. Um, so that has been a, a big moment for the industry, but I would say that um, robust regulatory process and transparency really does need to be at the core of this industry as it moves, you know, to different countries, um, as the companies try and, and seek that approval in different countries, and particularly also considering larger scales of production um, compared with that 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 Eat Just has proposed in Singapore. So yeah, the industry needs to commit to full transparency throughout this process um, as we move forward. The, um, the other major concern that, that often comes up in public surveys and something that I um, have focused on a lot in my research is to do with corporate concentration and whether um, these technologies will reinforce a food system that's dependent upon large scale, highly engineered uh, commodity agriculture versus scaling production through, say, um, sort of number of smaller farms and more holistic methods. Um, so just by way of background, there has been a relative absence of big public funding in the cellular agriculture sector. And so this has steered cultured meat and dairy ventures towards um, forming as private companies and innovating through intellectual property. Um, I think the trajectory that the sector is currently on does risk reinforcing the power of multinational food companies rather than disrupting them. Um, and that was the promise at the beginning of all this, that, that these new technologies would come in and disrupt the incumbents. And actually the opposite is happening now. Um, and this does have a number of consequences that I think we should be worried about and be you know, critically thinking about in the, the short, medium and long term. And this also links to public concerns um, that Anna mentioned and that, that a lot of surveys do um, kind of bring up about loss of livelihoods, rural communities, the kind of cultural heritage of farming and uh, sort of rural identity. So that's all linked in to this big question of corporate concentration. So just to finish, I think to address some of these risks really requires um, to think about two things. So number one, how we actually do innovation in this sector. So this is talking about the values and, and the kind of economic models that underpin the development of these technologies. So, you know, do we actually need more public funding to make this more open source, to kind of make it a more democratic process to, to counteract this concentration of power and ownership? And number two, what are the agricultural production systems that will support a scaled up cellular agricultural industry and who and what type of farming knowledge will be supported through these systems? 
So just to finish, I think there's a real responsibility for the cellular agriculture sector to engage with farmers and existing alternative food networks to learn about the food system. And if we are to have cellular agriculture um, as a scaled up industry, then we need to think holistically and radically about how this sector innovates and scales up. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Over to you, Jamie. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much indeed for having me here today. So I'm going to talk very, very briefly about the possibilities, um, how fast the, the, this disruption might move, might move and, and, and the scale of the impacts of this disruption. So disruptions are generally very badly understood. What we tend to do when we want to forecast the future is we kind of look backwards and we extrapolate current trends, both for the cost of technology, the adoption of technology, but also kind of conditions in society, the structure of the market and so on, we assume continues indefinitely. It's not like that. Disruptions are non-linear in almost every dimension. Uh, they're S-curves, essentially. And, and, and what drives disruption is generally the cost and capability of, 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 of competing technologies. So when we look at the cost curve of, of the new production methodologies, key amongst them precision fermentation, we see an extraordinary improvement in the, in the cost of producing um, proteins. And, and, and that cost has come down from about a million dollars per kilo in about the year 2000 down to under 100 kilos today. And by, by the mid 2020s will be under $10, which is where it has kind of cost parity uh, with animal grown proteins. And the capabilities are, uh, are improving dramatically. We're, we're able to produce food with the kind of um, attributes that we want, much better suited to, to um, you know, absorption by the human body. Uh, and it's kind of a, a kind of software model where we have constant improvement. So, you know, a cow is, is generally constrained by evolution but with precision fermentation. We've got constant improvement. Um, and, and it's this, it's this um, improvement in cost and capabilities that we think is going to drive a very, very rapid disruption. And that disruption will be an S-curve. It will be uh, driven by essentially the balance of feedback loops in the system, the, the, the kind of breaks that constrain adoption in the early stages and these accelerators that lead to a kind of virtuous cycle for the new technologies and a vicious vicious cycle, a death spiral for, 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 for the existing forms of food production. Uh, and it's important to note as well that disruptions represent a phase change. And what I mean by that is the existing system transforms completely. So the new system that emerges is different in every way and its architecture in terms of the possibilities, in terms of the value chain, in terms of the infrastructure and so on, a much more distributed system. What we're seeing is a, the, the production system turned on its head. What we have now is what we call an extraction-based system where we, we grow the whole plant or animal and break it down into the things we need. So the, the cheapest and easiest, easiest things to access once the animal or plant is grown is, is say the meat, which you just carve off the carcass. The hardest are the single molecules. You need to go through, through multiple rounds of processing to get there. The, the new model starts with the molecule or the cell and builds up. So the single molecule is, 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 is the cheapest and, and the steak is, is the hardest to get to. So that's how the disruption will unfold. It will start from individual molecules, from ingredients, uh, and, 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 and finally, um, it, it will get up towards the state, both as the capabilities get there, but also as the as, as cost of, of existing forms of meat and so on um, increase as, as, as all the other products that come from a cow get disrupted. Uh, and then we must remember also that disruptions have cascading impacts. Um, they, they impact every part of society, not just in terms of the cost and, and, and the impact on poverty, lower, lower cost food and dramatically lower cost by the mid 2030s, but also the impact on our health, the impact on the environment in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, water use, you know, pollution and so on. The impact on our land, we think by the mid 2030s, about 70 percent of land used for agriculture will be freed up, able to be used for other other uh, 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 other uses and, and the impact on pathogens, for instance, but also things like food security, a far more secure food system, much more local self-sufficiency, far more resilience. So the profoundly positive consequences that come with this form of disruption. Uh, and it's a, it's a disruption that's essentially inevitable. You know, the, the improvements in cost and capability mean that this disruption will happen. The challenge we face going forward is to ensure that we capture the potential benefits of this system and we avoid the adverse consequences. So market design and so on, ensuring that the industry that emerges is much more like kind of open source software rather than the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so we allow the, the benefits of lower cost production to flow through to the consumer are critical 
in, 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 in how we design our food system going forward. Brilliant, thanks, Jamie. Alice? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Anna, and good evening, everybody. There's three things here that I think are really important to be considering in the context of the whole discussion around lab-grown meat and any potential disruption to animal agriculture, specifically to the UK as well. I think the first is that lab-grown meat aside, animal agriculture is on the cusp of an absolutely transformational change. One that I should be at pains to point out is very much needed and is well overdue. I think globally, the status quo um, for animal agriculture is unsustainable and we're not producing meat within environmental limits. The UK government has acknowledged this. Um, and so through the brand new Agriculture Act, uh, we're, we're now seeing the phase out of the direct payment system in favour of a scheme that rewards farmers and rewards land, manage, ma land managers for delivering public goods. So notably, those are ones that improve the environment. This, I think, completely changes the landscape, so to speak, um, in terms of how we talk about lab-grown meat as being a solution. It's a sea change in policy by UK policymakers looking at land in a sort of completely different way. But honestly, I think that these policymakers are kind of just catching up to what's been happening over the last 10, 20 years of innovation and leadership and kind of pioneering work that we're seeing from farmers and their managers, not just in the UK, but across the world, looking at things like regenerative agriculture and agroecology and um, agroforestry and all of that kind of stuff, which I can um, get on more to in a, in a second. The second thing is that we're in a climate crisis and a nature crisis. We don't have any time to lose. We know that. And for this reason, I don't think we can be waiting for five or 10 years for technological solutions or science-led solutions like lab-grown meat to become mainstream and to become available. Not to say we shouldn't be you know, investing in them and researching them heavily, but we, I just think across the board, across the whole of climate change, we need to stop relying on silver bullets that are in the future and start making immediate changes within our existing systems. And luckily, we know exactly what to do when it comes to animal agriculture. It's something that we're already moving towards. It's a combination of changing farm management practices, making supply chain improvements, um, improving incentives and changing regulation. And it definitely can be done. Um, but the third thing that I think we need to remember is that in the UK, livestock production is often quite a positive story. It gets lost a lot, I think, when we're talking about um, in a sort of global narrative around livestock production and livestock consumption. When you talk about livestock consumption, you do miss a lot of the nuance around livestock production. And so here we do have a lot of small family farms, the complete opposite of the big um, corporate concentration that um, Dr. Sexton raised. And these small family farms are raising livestock um, on grass, they're doing it well, they're doing it sustainably, they're doing it at the right stocking rates with the right inputs, and they're contributing to these sort of farm ecosystems that are really important and they improve biodiversity, they're keeping carbon stored in soils, um, they're making use of permanent pasture land that arguably couldn't be used for much else and that might be rain fed, so there's a small water footprint that goes with that. These are some of our most valued landscapes when it comes to uh, biodiversity and habitats, but also a social and cultural perspective. They support rural communities and um, they support tourism. And on top of that, they're yeah, huge carbon stores and soils, soils hold three times more carbon um, than in the atmosphere, which we just can't afford to lose. And so in many circumstances and granted, not all, the best use of this land might be to manage it really well with livestock. And the other part of that is this move that I think we're seeing that's arguably in the opposite direction to something like lab-grown meat in, in which people are kind of really starting to reconnect with nature. I think it possibly has something to do with the pandemic, but they're moving towards these kind of regenerative systems and looking to create you know, the perfect circular economy within a farm holding. And this can't be done without incorporating livestock. So I think it's really important that farming moves away from its reliance on fossil fuels and definitely um, on artificial nitrogen based fertilizers, which are also uh, really energy intensive. But this can't be done again without livestock. Organic doesn't exist at scale without livestock. So I think this is, yeah, people sort of also really like feeling connected with their food and that kind of fits with that worldview, I think. So while by no means am I saying that the current system is sustainable, and I do think there needs to be a shift, the trend and direction is a shift away to away from such large levels of consumption of meat. 
And I think lab-grown meat has huge potential and it's really exciting, but I think it'll have to be part of a suite of low carbon food options and ultimately all types of food, animal agriculture included, can become low carbon. And carrying on from that, Alice, it's really fascinating. So do you think lab-based meat would threaten smaller scale farmers more than, than the larger ones? Or is there a way that perhaps there's more value in those small farms because they're sequestering more carbon perhaps or doing things more re regeneratively? Yeah, I think, there's, I think there is huge value in those farms. And I think the crux of my argument is really, um, not, I don't really necessarily think that lab-grown meat pose a huge threat to all of animal agriculture. Like I said, there is a trend moving that way, um, not just to lab-grown meat, but towards plant-based proteins and less but better meat and all of that kind of stuff. And I think that was reiterated just yesterday in the um, Climate Change Committee's sixth carbon budget. Um, but I think based on what people want to eat and, and the less but better argument, I think there will always be a role for those smaller scale farmers like we have in the UK who um, have lower livestock levels, who manage their farms in sustainable ways and maybe don't have options to do anything else. They can possibly um, look to be capitalising on a high value market maybe, um, because there's always going to be, I think, a base level of people who aren't comfortable eating um, lab grown meat. And I, I don't count myself as one of those at all. I mean, if it's available and eating it, I would have, in and in around, I would have no problem eating it. But I do think there's a percentage of the population who aren't on that, that same page. And so if there are, if there is going to be a proportion of people eating meat, why would we not make it the best, most sustainable meat? And that's yeah. what is arguably grown in the UK. And there is a huge argument for less land being used for precision fermentation and, and freeing up that land. But there's no guarantee that that land will be used in a restorative way for nature. Like property developers could come along and, and build huge concrete buildings. I, there's no guarantee. It's kind of dependent on the financial incentives, I suppose. So I wonder what you guys think in terms of where that balance is. Like, like you say, Alice, it's a kind of a mix. It's one, one part, one piece of the jigsaw. But Jamie, you kind of think it's going to really, really swing quite dramatically. Like, where, where is that going to, where's that trigger point going to balance, I suppose? Jamie, would you like to yeah. take that one? Yeah, so, so I, I, I mean, you know, my, my view is that there's an inev inevitability to this. Um, I mean, disruptions tend not to sort of stop halfway. You know, we will, we will see um, animal agriculture as, as, you know, as we get to 20, 30 percent, it becomes... Um, you know, much harder to to compete in in, in livestock farming. You, you know, you, you have, for instance, you know, leather, the leather market replaced. We can now produce collagen through precision fermentation. We can design leather of kind of any size, any thickness, kind of any attribute we want. Um, and, and, and so if, you know, you can no longer use the hide in, um, you, you know, for any use, it, it goes from being a kind of asset to being a liability. You know, instead of being able to sell it, you have to pay to dispose of it. And so that's going to kind of push the cost up of, of, of the meat and the remaining products we get from animals. So, you know, the, the way disruptions work is that, you know, they tend to go through the market, um, you know, once these kind of feedback loops get triggered. But you're right to, 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 to talk about, you know, land and, and, and so on as a key, a key issue we need to think about, because if we don't plan for this, I mean, you know, and, and the job losses as well and the industries and livelihoods that are destroyed. I mean, what we've tend to do in the past is we've kind of stumbled into disruptions and we've cleaned up the mess retrospectively. And it's taken decades for, you know, regions affected by this and, and, and people in industries to, to recover and to, to, to find other, 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 other livelihoods. Um, and, and, and so in many reasons, that's, you know, that's why we set up RethinkX, was, was to, to highlight how fast and how profound these disruptions can be. So we can begin to, to plan, not just to avoid those adverse consequences, um, but, to, but to, to, to make sure we seize the opportunities. And that land that's freed up is an enormous opportunity. I mean, we did the sums on, you know, what, what would it mean if we, if we, if we, if we just reforested 10% of the land that's freed up in, in America? And it would, it would offset, um, you know, 100% of emissions from all agriculture. 
And if you reforested all of the land that's freed up, that we think will be freed up by 2035, that would be enough to, to offset all of 2018's emissions from any source in the US, if you maximize fast you know, carbon sequestration in, in how you plant. So you know, there are huge opportunities for that. I mean, that's hypothetical. I'm not saying we're gonna go that far. And we actually think emissions across the economy will, 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 will drop as we disrupt you know, our transportation system, our energy system, and all kinds of other parts of the economy. Um, but if we don't plan for that, and we if we don't if we don't um, um, you know now ahead of the disruption decide what we want to happen to set the rules to set the parameters, yeah, we're going to stumble into a pretty dystopian future, and I think that's the challenge. I'm particularly concerned about kind of livelihoods. I think you know what we don't want to do is try and protect uncompetitive industries uh, and subsidize them. You know, we need to protect people, not businesses, and and, and find ways to. To, to, to ease the pain and to, to, to provide kind of pathways for people to find, um, you know, alternate livelihoods. And, and, and that's an enormous challenge that we've always historically failed at. Do you see it as a real replacement then, this kind of disruption curve that you talk about? Do you see it as a real replacement of animal agriculture or do you still see a place in the landscape for animal agriculture in some way? I know, I think there'll be a niche market. It's kind of, you know, people still ride horses, even though we don't use them for transportation. People still, you know, listen to vinyl records and so on. I, I think increasingly we'll see, I, I think the disruption actually starts with industrial agriculture first. I think, I think, you know, the people who are committed to meat want to eat good quality product. They want to know where it's come from. They're eating it because it has kind of organic benefits, all the things that Alice talked about. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think, you know, that industry actually, you know, might, you know, will, will survive longest and, and perhaps even, you know, even expand. I think in, you know, the really negative feedback loops hit the industrial, the industrial industries where, you know, the abattoirs find they utilize less. So the costs of, of, of processing kind of, um, you know, spiral upwards and so on you get these kind of nasty vicious cycles that affect the industrial industry and also the quality of the product i mean you know most of the meat that's served in you know across if you think of big swathes of the world the kind of processed meats that you see that, that represent a big chunk of our of our of our diet they're not healthy in any way they're not good for us in many ways you know that they're, they're um you know pathogen rich <laughs> and um and 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 so i think that's the industry that that that, that um that gets disrupted first. I think, I think the kind of pastoral organic industry, you know, will survive longer, but ultimately it's going to be very high cost. And I think, you know, we will see a kind of upwards um, trajectory for the cost of meat that comes from, from, from those sorts of animals, partly because all the other pieces of the puzzle, you know, the hundreds of products that a cow gets processed into, you know, those markets get disrupted. Um, and, and you talked about cost in terms of the ownership side of things. How do you feel about these technologies being concentrated in a really sort of a handful of global food multinationals or corporations? And, and should this concentration be avoided? If so, how, like where does policy and regulation come in to, to open up that intellectual property? Yeah, so I think what's important is, is that consumers you know, get the benefit of the lower cost that we're seeing. And, and, and so we see in say pharmaceuticals where you know, cost cost of production bears no relation to price. And the industry is structured that way because you know, we need incentives to, to invest heavily to develop drugs and, and treatments and so on and so forth. And so, so you know, we, we allow a market that allows kind of control of IP to the extent that it does. I think there's no excuse for that in the food market. It's very different dynamics. The cost of developing new proteins is dropping. I mean, we're seeing kids develop proteins in science projects. I mean, it's, you know, the cost trajectory is, 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 is massively downwards. And so there is no, you know, I would, you know, there is real, no, no real excuse or, or no, you know, driver to allow, you know, essentially the privatization of intellectual property. And, and so if we can have open platforms that allow the sharing um, and, 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 um, and, 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 and so on of the intellectual property, I, I, I think that's a starting point that we need an open market, a market that resembles essentially open source software rather than, rather than kind of ph pharmaceuticals. Um, you know, I think we'll see platforms, you know, production platforms that, 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 that spread out and, 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 and come to dominate. But I don't think that um, that, that is necessarily a bad thing if we're, because I don't, I don't think there's anything in, in, in the production platform that allows anyone to capture, you know, too much of the pie. I, I, you know, I, I expect to see, a, you know, we talk about a kind of network and a node structure where we have a kind of global information network where we can all kind of share and exchange ideas and recipes for, um, you know, for foods and so on and so forth, and they're, they're manufactured or, or, or produced, you know, in, in localized 
kind of self-sufficient production hubs. And, 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 and that's, you know, that, you know, I think is, 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 is the structure of the market that, that, that will be, um, <clears throat> you know, that is likely to emerge. But I, you know, I do think we can really mess this up if we, you know, if we allow, um, you know, the wrong sort of regime and market structures to emerge. And how do you feel about that, Alex, in terms of, you mentioned about that concentration of, globe of control, like what, 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 how do we get around that? So I think um, th some people do see benefits in the kind of big multinational companies uh, turning to these alternatives so quickly, um, you know, over, over recent years, they're sort of hedging their bets with them. In terms of scaling these things quickly, uh, you know, the existing infrastructure that they have to, to really, you know, put this all around the world, you know, if, if Burger King entirely shifted to, you know, the impossible burger and, and plant based, you know, the scale at which they can they can roll that out um, could have a massive effect. So um, there is a kind of uh, alliance in a way of, you know, the fact that we are facing such urgent crises and, and the, the scale and, and um, speed at which big companies could act. Um, but I have really big concerns about the medium to long term impacts of that and the fact that, yeah, it does continue that concentration of power and ownership. And I think just responding to um, the previous comment by Jamie around, you know, passing on the, the kind of cost benefits to the consumer, I think, I think a lot of people will also be nervous about sort of continuing this love affair with cheap food as well. Um, I think there's a massive conversation that's ongoing and has been, you know, kind of ongoing for a while now about making sure that the costs are going back to the producers as well so that they can sustain uh, a, well, a sustainable livelihood, essentially. So I think um, this all ties into, you know, what what kinds of um, ec economic and innovation models we're, we're trying to do all of this through. Um, are we trying to to democratize the food system as well as you know trying to to and then that's in terms of who is in the food system you know who who has the power who has the power to make decisions and um, ownership over over production I just think it, it needs to be part of this conversation because to to re you know go down the same tracks of trying to just make this as cheap as possible in the hands of the few is just not going to create um, a sustainable and fair food system. So does that all come down to regulation ultimately? It comes down to regulation. It comes down to um, the types of funding that are supporting um, the sector. So I think there is a real drive at the moment now to, uh, and recognition that the private sector, um, you know, has done a lot to get these startups off the ground, but it isn't great for long-term investment and for doing that kind of broader um, spread of the benefits, you know, beyond a few companies and, and investment firms. So I think, if we can get public, big public funds to invest in, in longer term, you know, R&D and, and uh, getting the knowledge out there, sharing a lot more of the knowledge, hopefully um, could, could go some way to, to sort of keeping it in the hands of the many. Yeah, and, and I'm wondering what you guys think about how should government respond and how, how, how government has a responsibility and a, and a role to play in, in terms of that regulation, like will creating new policies now help the emerging tech kind of be better established in the future and more fairly distributed perhaps? Um, I don't know who would like to tackle that <laughs> question first. Alice, have you got any thoughts on how the government can play a role in that? Yeah, I'm trying to think about it in the context of the kind of government policy space that I work in, which is more along the lines of land use. Um, so it'd be, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, we know the direction of travel they're going in terms of land use and whether that kind of streamlining of climate change considerations and nature and biodiversity considerations into policy happens across the board and starts filtering through um, all types of government policies. You'd hope so with the 10 point plan. It seems like that is um, that they the government is interested in big transformation, transformational change of policy and to have these kind of considerations streamlined through. But in all honesty, I probably don't know enough about the regulation that directly pertains to this kind of stuff to comment on how it would impact lab-grown meat necessarily. 
I mean, I think if I can just jump in, I think one of the main things that has already come up within the conversation is this absolutely essential need for having a land management strategy um, in that, that accompanies a cellular agriculture um, industry because of the potential to free up the land, you know, collapsing production onto much smaller footprints of land. Um, you need to have a plan for what's going to happen so that, you know, that land doesn't uh, or the, the land use change doesn't undermine the potential benefits of of setting up cellular agriculture. So that's something that I think particularly at this current moment with everything that's going on with the sort of post-Brexit national food strategy, the, the ELM, Environmental Land uh, Management Scheme, you know, this could all be joined up potentially. I mean, some of it is a still a bit early days, I suppose, but the conversations could be, you know, started um, and the details can be filled in as the, the companies and the, the ventures really, you know, start to get a grips on, on what a scaled up sector could look like. But that is, I think land is such a crucial um, part of, of where government and the industry and the existing food sector, um, you know, should, should be having that dialogue. And in terms of making those decisions, is it really key that we quantify the pros and cons and kind of weigh things up? Like, are there any really robust life cycle analyses that compare lab-based protein with livestock production on land like has that analysis been done or is that something that needs to be done in the near future Jamie perhaps yeah no, I mean some of it's been done right so so we know that the, there is you know far lower environmental impact far, far less water use far less land use far less greenhouse gas emissions and so on so so, so, so we you know we, we we see that so there are there are some some big um there, there are some big benefits of of this I mean you, you know I mean you know, enormous benefits actually that, 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 you know, if scaled across the whole industry, you know, transform, you know, potentially, you know, agriculture from a, and land from a carbon source to a carbon sink. Sorry. Yeah, that's, that's the right way around. Sorry. <laughs> I thought I'd gone the wrong way. But, you, you know, that's a, that's a challenge. I mean, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're producing, for instance, things like palm oil through precision fermentation now. And as the cost comes down, you know, we'll disrupt that whole industry. We just won't be extracting it from trees anymore. And that will take a lot of pressure off, you know, de deforestation in, 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 in parts of the world. You know, as we replace, um, you know, cows, we won't need to cut down rainforests to feed them. Um, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see some huge kind of knock on benefits that come with this. We'll take the pressures off our oceans. It will take the pressure off our, our soil. And, and you know, I, I, th I think both Alex and Alice made a very good point there that the challenge is to is to decide what we want to do with that land ahead of time, right? And it's much easier to do it now than it is when everyone's kind of trying to get their dirty mitts on it and 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 develop it and do whatever. But we have to think about it in the context of other disruptions that are going on, because we're we're seeing a transformation of the whole economy, and and as we transform, you know, you know communications and 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 um, and transportation, for instance, it will transform, you know, how cities function, for instance, and the spread of cities and the density of cities. And so we might want to use some of that to allow cities to spread out and become less dense when we're not constrained as we are currently by, you know, transportation links and, and, and communications links. Um, so we need to have a kind of integrated discussion. We need to see land and agriculture as part of a much broader system and understand how, you know, the different pieces of the puzzle interact before we, we, we dive in and make decisions on, on, on what to do with that land or, or, or even how to govern the market. And that disruption, like you've just touched on, sort of has a massive impact on the livelihoods. And Alice kind of mentioned before the, the impact that might have, but how do, we, how do we protect those livelihoods or how do we make those rural businesses more resilient to, if this disruption is happening and it's starting, that people can be in quite a vulnerable position and it's they're kind of open to loss of their income and and their business that's right that's right can, can i just quickly comment on that so so i mean normally with a disruption what happens is you know jobs get destroyed in one industry you know one geographic location perhaps you know with one particular skill set and they get created somewhere entirely somewhere entirely different you know the new jobs require different skills different you know geographic locations and and, and the people who are uh, affected by it, you know can't make that transition they need to find other livelihoods i think this particular disruption actually gives us the opportunity uh, to protect livelihoods in some ways you know if we choose to reforest or rewild 
or, or, or do something to the, you know, to the land to, to, to have other benefits for society, then we can, we can create jobs you know, in exactly the same geographic locations um, requiring somewhat similar skills. And so I, th I think there is an opportunity here to be able to protect you know, the people who are, who are disrupted rather than the industries. And I think that's the challenge is, is you know, often we're tempted to prop up you know, uncompetitive, you know, disrupted industries. Um, you know, the challenge really is to ha is really to protect the people and, 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 and their livelihoods and provide them with some meaningful work. Thank you. Can I just come in on that? Um, I mean, yeah, I agree. And I think in terms of the way that we're preparing for these changes at the moment, it's happening through policy, it's happening through the environmental land management scheme. The ambition of the scheme is for some quite large landscape level change towards things like peatland restoration and tree planting, which you know I wholeheartedly support and can see where that is a dramatically better use of land in some circumstances. But the key would be making sure that these are financially viable options in the future for farmers and landowners, and that they can still enjoy an income from their land in some form, form or, of an, or another. This will be in part through the payment for public goods scheme where they'll get paid for maybe biodiversity improvements and things like that. But we also need to be making sure that they've got access to private markets. Um, and that might be through carbon trading and carbon markets and stuff like that. And then there's also, there are other options for UK farmers in particular through diversification. Um, I mean, I know there's a scheme going on, I think in Northern Ireland where they're um, trying to help farmers plant um, plant-based proteins essentially, and they're trying to sort of build up this market for that kind of stuff. And there are options for that in the UK. Um, and I, you know, I often think things like the most popular oat milk brand in the UK, I'm pretty sure the oats aren't grown here, but they could be, you know, there's, we do have options that we need to be thinking about, but it will be about looking at every single piece of land and thinking, what is the best option for this land? Is it trees? Is it restoring it if it used to be peatland? And in some circumstances, in plenty of circumstances in the UK, the best option environmentally and for rural li livelihoods and rural communities will be to keep it in livestock production. Alex, have you got any comments on that? I mean, this is really what my research going forward is, is going to be getting into. So I haven't got, um, you know, really rounded thoughts on this. But I, I guess for me, it's, it's really coming down to again, we've said this so many times, but but what we want the land to be used for in a place like the UK. And I think one of the the sort of visions of cellular agriculture is very much on, on more of the land sparing side of things. So, you know, you have your very concentrated uh, food production on a small footprint of land and then everything else is sort of given over to conservation and uh, the, the sort of a new type of rural livelihood and economy based on, on conservation. Um, and that is, you know, hotly debated with people who think land sharing should be the way that and it's the most, you know, ecological and uh, better for rural livelihoods, um, etc. And, and sort of cultural heritage as well. So I think um, I don't really have anything to add as in like concrete steps forward, but I just it really just comes down to that that question of, of what is the best use of land that is thinking in the round, not just, you know, in terms of yield and cheap food. Um, but is, is, is taking that more holistic um, approach. Yeah, it's kind of zooming out and looking at every single piece of the yeah. puzzle. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jim Elliott at Green Alliance now, um, who has some questions from the audience, um, some of which have submit, been submitted in advance, some have been um, added to the chat as we, as we go. Um, so over to you, Jim. Thanks, Anna, and uh, thanks to all the panellists. It's been really fascinating so far. We've had loads of questions coming in. I'm afraid we won't be able to get through them all, but we'll, uh, we'll do our best. So um, just to kick us off, and we've touched on this a bit already um, in terms of what kind of options uh, there might be for, for farmers um, if this disruption happens. We have a question here uh, at the top of the list um, from Dustin Benton. How do we invest farmers in the transition? Much of the opposition to lab slash plant-based meat is from farmers who feel they will be displaced. So, I mean, I can jump in here. Um, I think that there are some um, people within the cellular agric agriculture sector who are you know, seriously trying to think about what opportunities there could be um, to to incorporate farmers into the transition. So this comes down to which method 
that you're you know uh, sort of taking forward um some ventures see the prospect of having small donor herds um continue and that's how you go back and get your cells so you know potentially kind of uh, matching up cellular agriculture um bioreactors with small farms and you sort of make a i guess a kind of premium market of, of cultured meat potentially there's a lot of um plant-based uh, ingredients that potentially could feed into this through the, through the growth medium. There are um, question marks though about, and also obviously the plant-based alternatives as well, but trying to create a system um, to uphold, you know, a, a mass uh, industry of plant-based and uh, cultured meat, uh, sorry, cellular agriculture, uh, plant-based ingredients. We just need to make sure that that isn't basically the monocultures that we we currently have and I think you know there is a lot that's been going on about trying to research different kinds of crops for all of these things so that you can breed in diversity into the plant-based um, ingredients and crops that could support this industry but I think that all of this um, I would say isn't inevitable in terms of the design of everything so you know this is these are all conscious choices that have to to feed into that bigger picture that I keep uh, I keep returning to about how we're actually doing this and how we're um, choosing to scale this up. Can I add to that really quickly? Um, I think part of it is in sort of what we've been talking about with this yeah, new environmental land management scheme is to bring farmers along the transition might involve helping them view their land in a slightly different way is a an option for environmental delivery and not solely um, to produce food and I think it would be quite a hard thing for a lot to get their heads around so we've got this seven year transition period for them to get their heads around it but it's it's interesting hearing the way the conversation and dialogue around climate change in particular has and actually the nature crisis has shifted to a place where people are looking at land as holding the only real solution that is shovel ready and that we can start doing right now and looking at these nature-based solutions and things like that. And it's been interesting talking to our members and seeing yeah, their perception of their land completely shift when they realize that they don't just own land, but they've you know got this or manage land, but there's all this carbon underneath it and potentially carbon in the biomass above it. And they're looking at it as a solution to climate change and a solution to the nature crisis and not necessarily the enemy, which they might've felt like it is in the media over the past few years. And it's just, it is kind of just a mental shift as they start to perceive their land in a different way. And I think that is, you know, quite a big step in the first step probably. Thanks. Um, a related question to uh, what you were just talking about, um, Alex, around the, uh, is around the feedstocks. So uh, Lucy Bjork is asking, what are the major feedstocks which will underpin lab-based production? Is there a range of different ones or is there likely to be a major demand for a few raw materials? So um, there's actually, I don't know if I should be plugging a different conference that's going on right now, but um, there's the, the Maastricht um, International Cultured Meat Conference going on uh, today and, and tomorrow and um, there's there's been I think some presentations on that which I'm, I'm due to catch up on so this might be slightly outdated but essentially and, and maybe Jamie knows uh, more up-to-date stuff on this um, because a lot of this is proprietary information so it can be difficult to really get into the detail but essentially what a lot of the cultured meat um, products have used either you know in small or big concentrations has been the fetal bovine serum um, but they are trying to, to find alternatives to that plant-based alternatives to that um, because of the ethical and frankly, the cost uh, issues, the energy uh, issues that go along with, with using um, FBS. Um, in the Eat Just uh, chicken bites that were in the news um, last week, that it said in the, the news article that they used entirely plant-based growth uh, media. Um, I can't verify that either way, but I know that this is a massive, um, a massive you know part of the the puzzle that the industry is trying to to um to fix and essentially in the serum you have a bunch of amino acids glucose lipids you know it, it's like a little uh, sort of melting pot of of all the the things that you know life cells need to to grow and um there's also kinds of moves to try and and use algae and um other kind of enzymes to to sort of 
be part of that process uh, as well. So I think it's, it's a huge space for innovation. Um, and it currently is one of the biggest obstacles for the whole energy footprint of the of the sector. So there's a real impetus to try and uh, bring that down. Yeah, and I, I, I think it's a solvable challenge. I mean, I, in my understanding is that we're beginning to you know, produce, say, the growth hormones through precision fermentation, and 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 and, and that's allowing us to, you know, to, to, to essentially kind of take well, take the animal out of you know out of that part of um, production. But you know, ultimately, for certainly for precision fermentation, which I, I see playing a far greater role than just cell cultured meat in the in the in the in the kind of the future food market. Um, you know, ultimately, it's sugar water is, is, is a kind of major input. So it is kind of monocrop at some level. We need, you know, we need a lot of sugar to feed these reactions and, and, um, and these processes. Um, but, but, you know, again, ultimately, people are looking at how can we use kind of any biomass to do that? Can we use kind of leaves and, 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 and other forms of carbohydrate to, to fire these reactions? So, um, you know, they do tread very lightly on the land. I mean, we will need a, 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 a fraction of the land. And, 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 and so, you know, in terms of the, the, the production to feed these processes, it's, 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 it's not huge. And it's, you know, it's certainly going to become more efficient as the processes improve. I think this is also um, a particular part of the cellular agriculture puzzle that, um, you know, it could involve farmers, um, doing the, the you know potentially monoculture um, plant-based uh, kind of crops to to supply that glucose which has its own you know questions that we should be asking but also I, I know that um, this is an area that the pharmaceutical industry for instance is you know looking at potentially bringing their expertise to to take this away from you know the fields and, and into um, into the lab and and using you know enzymes etc to to to, to do the process instead. So that itself raises other, you know, questions about the pharmaceutical industry coming into um, a food production, you know, system that, that previously they've maybe not, you know, been able to do, or it's just a different, a different sort of door for them to, to open. So, you know, this, this is really all part of an ongoing innovation uh, kind of journey within within the sector. And, and again, it's all about choices, the choices that, that we want to, to make and how we want to design design it. Thanks. Um, a question which came up uh, from, uh, I think it was probably the most popular question on, on the, the questions that were submitted before the event, and it's coming up in the, in the question answer now as well, is around the um, comparisons of the environmental footprints of, uh, of these uh, kind of um, technical meat alternatives on the one hand versus um, uh, animal uh, meat and dairy and so people asking kind of uh, you know isn't having the right breed in the right place at the right density kind of good for the environment and then on the other hand people saying uh, hang on, you know, we've got um, plant-based alternatives and uh, kind of traditional vegetarian diets would be not better off going down, going down that route um, environmentally. So I wonder if the panel have views on, um, yeah, on, on those kind of environmental comparisons between the different options that we have of what we eat. Um, I mean, I can, the, some of the, the LCAs, I think it is, you know, a lot of work has been done a lot of it has been speculative out of necessity because so much of the the information and um, you know the the details of the design um, and the production process has been proprietary so you know a lot of public academics outside of these companies just don't have the the data to be able to do the really detailed LCAs that that um, can show what the impacts will be at scale and and again going back to the the serum and energy use um, those are still big question marks about uh, what the impacts will be at scale um, particularly if the sector doesn't decouple from fossil fuels um, I mean there was a paper by uh, John Lynch and, and Raymond Pierre Humbert who who did that uh, analysis looking at cultured meat versus different beef systems and essentially the headline is that if it if this is if the sector doesn't decouple from fossil fuels then um it's it's not you know looking good in terms of energy use so that's not to say that they can't but it's again it's something that that um, needs to be worked on um so i think what was the second part of the question 
Uh, so it, it was about uh, basically uh, the environmental comparisons between uh, land-based meat and then on the one hand, uh, different types of animal agriculture, and particularly kind of thinking about regenerative agriculture and, and kind of extensive grazing or, or what have you. And on the other hand, uh, kind of plant-based alternatives mm. um, and kind of more, more traditional sort of reduced meat diets. Yeah, I mean, I'll just jump in quickly. And then um, I think that is a debate that, you know, has followed the sector in terms of why are we spending all of this money, all of this energy, all of this time trying to create this new industry when there is perfectly good, you know, whole plant based ingredients, vegetarian diets that, that are already out there. I think one of the, the kind of responses to that from the industry has been that we're actually not trying to appeal to vegetarians and vegans. We're trying to, you know, appeal to the, the hardcore carnivores and uh, getting them to eat lentils and beans, you know, hasn't succeeded before so that you know we need to we need to make plants be like meat essentially um so you know you can debate that uh, and we're probably running out of time for that but i think one of the things that, that the sector really needs to grapple with is the idea that we're not really tackling overconsumption with this you know approach and, and the industry isn't really saying um eat this but not you know don't continue consuming as much as we currently have um and i think we're at risk of what's often called the, the Jevons paradox, where you make something super efficient, but because it's so efficient and potentially cheaper, you end up doing more of it. So I think you need to be having these conversations both in terms of you know making things more efficient, but also thinking about overconsumption and, and consumption rates as well. Can I just add to that when, when you're looking, if you're comparing the carbon footprints between lab grown meat and animal agriculture, I don't, I don't know the full details to be fair of lab grown meat, but you are looking at different types of greenhouse gases. You're looking at fossil fuel use versus methane, which is sort of part of a natural carbon cycle. And although I'm by no means one of those kind of methane apologists who think it doesn't, you know, make a huge difference. And I think we are at a point in the climate crisis where we should be doing absolutely everything we can to get all types of greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere and reduce how much we're putting in. But it, it, it is different. And the priority is acknowledged by the Committee on Climate Change frequently is that fossil fuels must be the priority. So if we're going to be replacing, you know, animal agriculture that might also be part of a system that's sequestering carbon, um, with a short term gas that is methane, if we're replacing that with the use of fossil fuels, it's something that just requires really careful long term thinking and consideration, I think, to make sure that we're not yeah, going down a track that actually will have a net negative impact. Thank you. That was there were some really great questions from the audience. So thank you all for your contributions. Um, I'm just going to ask our three speakers for um, a minute closing statement, um, just to summarise how will lab-based meat and dairy change the future of our food system, and what does a just transition really mean? Um, starting with Alex, please. Um, yeah, so I think what I always tend to, to try and reiterate um, in, in my talks is that with any technology there'll always be winners and losers and so this is no different um, you know for any kind of thinking about how to to do a just transition requires us to really have honest conversations about who wins and who loses and and to have honest conversations about whether these technologies that are in front of us that are getting all of the hype you know can deliver uh, the the promise of a better food system in terms of sustainability, fairness, you know, health, etc. And so, I don't think it's inevitable that they will just do it on their own. You know, technology it's it's a choice. It's a, a series of choices. And so, I would just really encourage the sector to to think about those choices and uh, and engage with the food sector at large in in how it innovates and scales up. Thanks, Alex. Jamie. Uh, so, so, I mean, I, I would start by saying, <clears throat> you know, th this disruption is largely inevitable. Um, you know, market forces dictate that we are going to see a transformed food system in the same way we'll see a transformed, you know, electric power system and, and, and so on. So, so there are, you know, enormous environmental benefits that come with this disruption, but, but also enormous benefits in all kinds of ways. Uh, now, clearly, there are adverse consequences, you know, that 
come to, to some degree with these transformations. The challenge is really to see what's happening, to recognize the potential of these new technologies, to, to recognize a huge opportunity that it is for humanity to solve kind of food poverty, hunger, some of these issues that have plagued us that are, are pretty much insoluble within the current system. You know, we now have the opportunity to solve. Um, and, and so we need to recognize that the challenge is to seize those opportunities, to seize the potential, and then to mitigate and deal with the adverse consequences that come with it, not to try and stop it and not to overestimate uh, essentially the power that we have from top-down regulation and policy. This is, this is kind of bottom-up market forces driving this, and we need to, to direct them and harness them, but certainly not to stop them. Thanks, Jamie. And Alice? Um, I mean, I agree. I think that change and a sort of disruption is inevitable, but I don't think it's necessarily entirely going in that direction. I think we're seeing an inevitable change towards nature-based solutions and towards making sure that farming sort of can become a really big part of the solution. And that is farming sort of the way that it is at the moment, but changing the current systems that we work in. Because like I said at the start, we're in a climate crisis. We don't have time to wait for these solutions to catch up. We need to be taking action and making change now. And farmers and landowners and land managers in the UK are very much ready to do that. And they're already starting to do it. So I think it's really important that we make sure that whatever happens, however this conversation in the direction of travel goes, we are supporting them every step of the way because there is no there is no tackling the climate crisis or tackling the nature crisis without land managers. So yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you to all our speakers and to the audience for joining us today. Um, just looking at the poll results, it's, it's shifted slightly up towards 10, seven and 10. So a little bit more positive than an hour ago, which is interesting. Um, this event has been recorded and it will be on the Green Alliance YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, so once again, thank you to Jamie, Alex and Alice, and thank you to Green Alliance for hosting and hope you all enjoyed it. <laughs>